page 8, and in a moment we'll be reading from verse 5. Before we start reading that, I'm just going to read a verse from Hebrews, which is the writers of the Hebrews comment about Noah. The reading in Genesis will be more about Noah. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. And then Genesis, chapter 6, starting at verse 5, page 8. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he'd made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had come, become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, the floodwaters came on the earth. Thank you very much, Val. Good morning. And please uh, keep your Bibles open there, or if you're reading your Bible on your phone, switch your phone on. I don't think my PowerPoint is going to work today. I've used very high-quality photos, and it hasn't synced effectively in Dropbox. So we're going to be going through the Old Testament and the New Testament, so you'll need 
your Bibles. And I'm pretty sad because one of the high quality photos I had is about a Welsh man because um, every year there's a bike ride. Oh, we have. Yeah, it's, you've got to see him. Uh, uh, every year there's a, there's a bike race around this time of year. And to be honest, usually I'm pretty disinterested. But this year, my attention and my affections were drawn, drawn towards the Tour de France and Geraint Thomas uh, because he became the first Welshman to win the prestigious event. Maybe I'm going to preach in the strongest Welsh accent you ever heard in a bar today. But, uh, but as I was listening a week last Saturday afternoon, he was nearing the end of the time trial, uh, which is the last competitive stage, and with three kilometers to go as he ascended the final climb, uh, the commentators became quite concerned because he seemed to be having a wobble as he was doing that. He was losing time. And after 3,000 kilometers, he was in danger of losing the yellow jersey in the last three kilometers. And I was thinking, what, what was it that motivated Geraint in those closing moments? Well, surely it was the goal, the prize of winning the Tour de France. And so he dug deep and he persevered and he completed the race. And the Christian faith is often compared to a race in the Bible. And the book of Hebrews was written to writers who are finding it tough to stay in the race. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer says, let us fix, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And it's great to have principles and truths to help people uh, continue, but one of the most powerful ways to, in, to be encouraged in life and faith is to hear other people's stories, isn't it? Of how they endured tough times and were victorious. And that's what Hebrews chapter 11 is all about. And so we're doing a series throughout the summer looking at these people of faith. And today we're looking at the life of Noah and his faith to build an ark, which is a massive boat, and he built it in a desert. But before we delve into the account of Noah's life and its relevance for us today, I want us to consider whether the flood was a literal historical event or meant to be used as a metaphor. My friend was speaking at a so-called Christian organization's retreat day a few weeks ago, and he mentioned the flood. And many people said to him, you don't believe that literally happened, do you? But the type of literature in Genesis chapter 6 to 9 is history. And so we should take the text as literal history. And here are six reasons why. Most of these are from Josh McDowell's classic and comprehensive book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. But, um, but before I go to them, I have to clarify that whilst I believe in a literal flood, I'm uncertain whether Genesis describes a global flood or a flood that affected all humanity on the globe at that time. But I'll let you discuss that over lunch, and then we can <laughs> fight it out during the week. So, six good reasons to believe that Genesis gives the original an accurate story. If you're not particularly interested in this, then just switch off for three or four minutes, come back for the sixth reason, and then we'll carry on with studying the Bible, okay? Okay, firstly, the flood account is more realistic and less myth mythological than other ancient versions. The similarities point towards a historical core of events, not towards plagiarism by Moses who wrote Genesis. For example, the names change. Noah is called Zayustra by the Sumerians, and they were an ancient people group in modern-day Iraq, and Ut-Tapishtam by the Babylonians. See why that name didn't stick around. But, uh, but whilst the names change, the basic story doesn't. A man is told to build a ship uh, to specific dimensions because God or the gods is going to flood the world. And he does it, uh, rides out the storm, and offers sacrifices upon exiting the boat. And the deity or deities responds with remorse over the destruction of life and makes a covenant, a promise with the man. But these core events point to a historical basis. Secondly, similar flood accounts are found all over the world, as you would expect uh, if such a significant event occurred. 
The flood is told of by the Greeks, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Mexicans, and the Hawaiians, to name but a few. And one list of the Sumerian kings treats the flood as a historical reference point. After naming eight kings who lived extraordinary long lives, tens of thousands of years, this sentence interrupts the list. Then the flood swept over the earth, and when kingship was lowered again from heaven, kingship was first in Kish. And then thirdly, only in Genesis is the year of the flood given as well as dates for the chronological relative, uh, chronology relative to Noah's life. In fact, Genesis reads almost like a diary or a ship's log of the events. The other versions contain elaborations indicating corruption. Fourthly, the, the ark would float, unlike the Babylonian version. The dimensions of the boat in Genesis, which were 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high, thus a rectangular, a long, wide, and low ship would ride the rough seas well. But the cubical Babylonian ship could not have saved anyone. The raging waters would have constantly turned it over on its side. And another striking difference between Genesis and the other versions is that in the, in the other accounts, the hero is granted immortality and exalted. But the Bible was realistic about Noah's sin. Only a version that seeks to tell the truth would include this faithful admission. And then number six, and most importantly, and come back to me if you switched off, Jesus and the other New Testament writers spoke about Noah and the flood as if they were historical. So there in Luke 17, verses 26 and 27 on the screen, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Jesus talking about himself. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. So what can we learn from Noah about faith? Well, firstly, faith believes God's word instead of trusting our own eyes. Hebrews 11 verse 7 says, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. And in Genesis 6, uh, verse 13, God appeared to Noah and said, as you can see on the screen, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof uh, an opening one cubit high up all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life, everything on earth will perish. And I will establish my kingdom with you. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives, with you. And then we also read in verse 22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Noah trusted God. Noah believed God's word. He believed that things were going to turn out exactly the way that God said they were going to turn out. And so he did everything as God commanded him. Noah believed God is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. And God told Noah that judgment was coming and Noah believed him. He believed that God was going to keep his word, so he built the ark. Now, it doesn't tell us in Genesis how long it took Noah to build the ark, but it was big. 450 feet is about 30 meters longer than a football pitch. And as far as we know, it was just Noah with maybe some help from his sons. And they had no power tools, so I'm guessing it took years to build And all that time, the only thing that kept Noah going was his faith in the Word of God. There was no one else around helping him. No one else who had heard God's Word, who could encourage him in what he was doing. He couldn't go to church on a Sunday or to home group on a Wednesday or Tuesday or Thursday or a prayer trip or missional community and meet up with other believers. 
who were also, I don't know, building arcs for the Lord. There was no one else following the Lord, urging him on. In fact, in fact as we see later, it, it's probably safe to assume that the people around him were doing the opposite. But that's not all. We're given very few details about how the ark was built in Genesis. But one thing we are told is that the rain didn't come until Noah had finished the ark and gathered everyone inside. On the day that they were inside, Genesis chapter 7, verse 13, and the verses following told us, on that day, the floodgates opened and the rain began to fall. Do you see what that means? Before that time, there was no hint in the weather that God was going to keep his word. God didn't appear to know when he was pouring down with rain and say, look, you better build an ark because this is going to last for a long time. Noah didn't spend the weeks and months and years that it must have taken to build the ark, each day marking the high tide on the sea, seeing that he was steadily going up the beach. There was nothing. No other evidence that Noah could see that the flood was coming. In fact, everything his eyes could see told him that life was going to carry on as normal, just as it always had done. Can you imagine Noah out there sawing away and hammering away, sweating like anything in that blazing sun, day after day, doing what? Building a boat for the end of the world. Day after day, week after week, year after year, preparing for something that there was no sign would ever come. Nothing Noah could see told him that the flood was coming, only the word of God. And that was enough. Because faith means believing God's word, not trusting our eyes. Noah feared that judgment was real. Now, why is this important for you and for me? Well, if we were going to spell faith, I think faith would be spelt R-I-S-K. It is living with risk. I was talking to my dad on, on Friday, and uh, he was a pastor for 44 years, and he said, what, what are you doing over the next couple of weeks? And I said I was preaching on Hebrews 11 and Noah, and he said, isn't it interesting? And no commentator that I've read has, has pointed this out. So my dad is a wise guy. Isn't it interesting that often we talk about faith as quite reflective, quite passive, almost intellectual. But in Hebrews 11, it's all about action. Noah built an ark. Abraham left his home and went to another country. They were living by faith. They were taking risks. It made a difference in how they acted and lived what they did. How does faith impact your life? What risks are you taking that if God doesn't come through, it's going to fail? Over the last couple of months, we've become convinced that we should extend our house in order to foster uh, more children. And uh, we, had to, we made a decision to commit to a certain builder for a variety of reasons that I can't go into now, but the bank that had said, yes, we'll loan you the money, suddenly said, no, we won't. And we'd signed a contract with the builder. They were coming this Thursday on the 9th of August. And to quote Alex Ferguson, it was again, again a little bit squeaky bum time <laughs> a couple of weeks ago because the bank was like, we can't, we can't do it. It was something with HMRC because Rebecca's a foster carer and her income wasn't fully recognized and all this kind of stuff. And so our bank worked, our manager worked so hard with the underwriters and eventually they said, okay, we'll, we'll do this for you. And they granted that a week last Monday while we were in the Keswick Convention. But I was convinced that God wanted us to do this because last summer we didn't have a foster placement for five months. And if you're in a household with two incomes, if you take one of those incomes away for five months, that's going to make an impact. And we said, God, do you want us to foster care? We don't have to do this. We can do something else. But we felt the Lord say, yes, this is for you. And he honored that. So then this year, he said, okay, live by faith, take the risk. I'm not saying everyone should have an extension. I'm not saying you're going to be prosperous and wise. We've had our house burgled twice in the last two years. We experience tough things as well, but God is faithful. When you're convinced that God has spoken to you, live by faith. But specifically about Noah, 
What difference does a flood many, many years ago make to our lives? Well, here's a tool for understanding the Bible, okay? One way of understanding the Old Testament is to see how the New Testament interprets it. So let's hear what Jesus and the Apostle Peter say about Noah. In Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, Jesus is talking to his disciples about the end of the world. And when he says this, as you can see the screen, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days of, before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood and t- uh, came and took them away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And then in 2 Peter, verses 3 to 7 and verse uh, 10, In the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. He's talking about Noah there. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And then verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Ever since Jesus left 2,000 years ago, Christians have been waiting for his return. All the promises that God made in the Bible have come true except for one. And that is that Jesus will come again. And that when he comes, it will be the end of this world and the beginning of the next. Do you see? Our situation is exactly the same as Noah's. When we look around at the world, there is no sign that Jesus is coming back. There's no inkling. Nothing we perceive tells us that this world will suddenly come to an end. But God's word tells us it will. We set our alarm clocks in the, in the evening to wake us up in the morning. We, we book our holidays months in advance. We save our money month by month for a rainy day or a dream car. And these things are good and prudent. But one wise Christian told me, I plan as if I'll live to a ripe old age, but I live as if Jesus is coming back tonight. But many of us never stop to think for a moment that next summer might never come. Or that tomorrow might never come. Our eyes tell us, of course it will. It always does. But God's word tells us that one day it won't. And Jesus will come back. Because faith means believing God's word, not trusting our eyes. Do you? Do you live by faith? What evidence is there in your life? that we live by faith and we live expecting that Jesus could come back at any time. And then secondly, faith means fearing God more than anything else or anyone else. Look again at Hebrews 11 uh, verse 7. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. What do we fear? What, What concerns you? as you go to bed at night or when you wake up in the morning. Well, some people fear missing out. This week it was revealed that 78% of people in the UK have smartphones and that six out of 10 people cited that they couldn't live without their phone. And the number one reason for this was because of social media. People want to be connected. And in moderation, this is a good thing. But the problem is that the news feeds never come to an end. You will always miss out on something or someone. And also Instagram and Twitter and Facebook are projecting an image that people want to portray. I've yet to see someone post a selfie of themselves when they've just woken up, when they're all disheveled and uh, bleary-eyed. And yet when we look 
at other, other people's polished lives. As we're looking at that, we, can, we know our own frailties and our own insecurities, and they are just fed by comparing ourselves with others. But when you fear God above all else, you come to a father who knows you and loves you, and he knows everything in the world as well, and he's in control. So if you're with him, you will never ultimately miss out. Yes, there's a cost to being a Christian, but he honors you. He is no person's debtor. Other people fear being single and a lack of companionship uh, or romance. Ernest Becker, the Jewish-American atheist and author of Denial of Death, when reflecting on the impact of Western culture rejecting God as their love and passion, he wrote this. If he, human beings, uh, if he no longer had God, how was he to know that his life mattered? One of the first ways that occurred to him was the romantic solution. He fixed his urge to cosmic heroism onto another person in the form of a love object. The self-glorification that he needed in his innermost nature, he now looked for in the love partner. The love partner becomes the divine ideal within which to fulfill one's life. All spiritual and moral needs now become focused in one individual. Salvation itself is no longer referred to as an abstraction like God, but can be sought in the beautification of the other. And he mentions that this is often seen in songs. So I'm going to read out a song lyric now, and I'd like you to tell me who sings this. Uh, and I'd particularly like you to tell me if you're a teenager here. I'm broken here tonight, and darling, no one else can fix me. Only you, only you, and no one else can fix me, only you. Who sings that? Little Mix, that's right, and Cheat Codes. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Now, the Bible says it's good for humans not to be alone. But surely only God can carry the weight of, I'm broken here tonight, no one else can fix me, only you, only you. And yet they're singing about a romantic relationship. And my friends, he offers that to us. The one who loved us so much that he sent his own son so that we could come back into relationship with him is the one who wants us. And he knows us, everything about, he knows everything about us and he still wants to know us intimately. And then others fear uh, the church and religion and they feel they're not, uh, they need to do the right thing to be accepted and made right with God. And in the Roman Catholic Church, there have been many comparisons of being in the ark as being part of the church. Uh, Pope Pius IX, who is Pope, I think he's the, the longest standing Pope from 1846 to 1878, said this, it must be held by faith that outside the apostolic Roman Catholic Church, no one can be saved. That this is the only ark of salvation that he who shall not have entered therein will perish in the flood. And some writers have also said that the Pope is the one who drives the church, and he's the one who drove the ark. But the ark in, um, well, he didn't drive the ark, obviously, but, but there's a picture. If the ark is the church, the Pope is driving the church. But the ark in Genesis didn't have a tiller, didn't have a rudder, because God was steering the boat. God closed the door of the ark. God designed it and told Noah how to make it. God brought it to rest when the waters had subsided. The church is not the ark. Jesus is the ark. We preach Christ crucified, and it is by grace that you are saved, not by being part of a specific church. I have many friends who are in a, a, a Catholic church and they are Christians. I'm not saying all Catholics are not, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying Jesus is the one we put our hope on. So 
So who are you trusting in? And what difference does it make to your life? My friends, have holy fear. Fear God, not anything or anyone else. What does it mean to fear God? And this is where we're going to close. Well, one thing is that we love people, not fear people. Do you notice when Val was reading that interesting phrase in Hebrews 11? It says, by faith, Noah condemned the world. What does that mean? And how on earth does that show that Noah loved people instead of fearing them? Well, we need to go back to Genesis 6 and Genesis 6 verse 5. It says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The whole world was wicked and evil. And God said that he regretted that he had made mankind and that he decided to wipe them out. And then we read the most amazing words in verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah believed the truth and chose to follow God. And so it tells us he became a righteous man, a man who was right with God. And I think it's safe to assume that one righteous man living in a world of wickedness and evil stood out. And if his new way of life wasn't enough to make him stand out, well, well, then he began building an ark. Now, we need to be careful not to read in between the lines of the Bible here, but I think it's fair to imagine that people must have started asking a few questions. Word got around, Noah's got religion. He's been in a boat for the end of the world. He thinks God's going to wipe us all out for being bad. The people were wicked and evil. They weren't offering a lending, a, hand, a lending hand or telling him, that's good for you if that's what you believe. And so, one way that Noah condemned the world was by his faith. Because it provoked, it convicted people and they reacted to it. In 1 Peter 3, Noah is used as an example of suffering for doing good. The people hated Noah and his ark, because it was a great big reminder of the God they hated and that they were trying to run away from. And so Noah's righteous life showed up their sin all the more clearly. And that's why it says, by faith Noah condemned the world. His faith was met by their wickedness. My friends, there may be some of you in your families or your workplaces where you're living for Jesus and people are mocking you and persecuting you and ridiculing you. And to be honest, you haven't done anything wrong. And Paul does say that all who aim to live a, a godly life will be persecuted. Now we're not, he didn't say we're being persecuted because we're stupid or arrogant or insensitive. So aim to live a godly life, but you will be persecuted. So be encouraged, you're like Noah. But then how did Noah respond? Did their jibes make him stop? Did their threats intimidate him? Well, no. He didn't fear the people around him. And he didn't hate them. And this is the second way uh, he condemned them. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 tells us that he became a preacher of righteousness. He didn't fear people around him. He loved them. He loved them so much that even though all of them rejected him, he kept on warning them of the truth of God's judgment and of the truth that they could still be saved if they turned back to him. Do you see? Faith means loving people, not fearing them. My friends, Noah trusted God. He put his faith in God and believed God's word He recognized that humans were sinful and that God is our judge and that judgment is coming. But he also believed that the only way to be saved from God's judgment was to turn back to God, to trust him and to follow him and build the ark. Noah had faith and his faith was counted as righteousness. 
And so when the flood came and the wicked people on the earth were destroyed, Noah was saved. Judgment came as Noah knew it would, and he was safe, just as he knew he would be. Why? Because he believed God's word. And have you? Do you? If you claim to be a follower of Jesus today, how today, this week, are you going to believe God's word and act on that? And my friends, if you've never trusted him, come to him now. Bow your knee to him. Accept that he's Lord and Savior because one day you will bow and acknowledge that he is Lord. But that will be a terrible day. And today it will be a beautiful day. It will be life and life to the full. Rest in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you love us more than we can imagine. You love us even though we don't deserve it. Thank you that you don't treat us as our sins deserve, but you made a way for us to be renewed, forgiven, brought back into relationship with you. Help us all to trust you and to live by faith and not by sight. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is within us for those who trusted you. Would we give ourselves to your Holy Spirit's promptings? Amen. Amen.